It's very satisfying to help people. I just can't imagine a better job. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm Michael Ettinger from Ettinger Law Firm. And uh, this is, um, I believe, the third in our series of six Zoom side chats. We started this um, during the pandemic and uh, it was uh, popular. So we repeat it a couple of times a year. So thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the author of uh, Elder Law Estate Planning and uh, the president of Ettinger Law Firm. Um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. If you have any questions during the presentation, please uh, feel free to uh, type in your question in the Q&A button. At the end, we'll take all your questions. I'm gonna share my screen with you now. Um, you got these slides with the confirmation uh, for the seminar. Uh, so you do have them. And uh, today we're going to talk about Medicaid asset protection strategies. Uh, Ettinger Law Firm, our practice is limited to elder law estate planning, uh, which means trusts and estates, wills and probate, estate tax saving strategies, Medicaid trusts, Medicaid applications. As you can see below, we have offices uh, throughout New York State, Nassau and Suffolk counties, total of five offices, downtown Brooklyn, Staten Island, South Avenue, White Plains and Westchester, New City and Rockland, Middletown and Orange County, Fishkill and Rhinebeck and Dutchess County, Albany, we're on Wolf Road, and Saratoga on Broadway. So let's uh, start with strategy one, caregiver agreements. These are also known as personal services contract, and this occurs when uh, a family member, usually an adult uh, daughter, sometimes a son, uh, is acting as a caregiver, either in the parent's home or in their own home. Uh, uh, and, and sometimes they're live-in and sometimes they're not. These contracts um, are uh, a way to shelter money because money paid for care is not a gift to the son or daughter, provided it's paid pursuant to a contract that meets Medicaid uh, uh, guidelines so uh, or Medicaid rules. So this is compensation. It's not a gift. You're paying the caregiver for taking care of you and also possibly for room and board. Um, so these agreements uh, require that the services to be performed are detailed, uh, which naturally uh, everybody's care is different. So we list uh, what services are being performed um, and it has to be based on the going rate for such services in the county, 2,000 a month, 3,000 a month, 4,000 a month, that sort of thing, depending on whether board, room and board is included or just caregiving services. Um, the one of the requirements that Medicaid has is that you need a physician's note stating that the care is needed and generally outlining what the nature of the care is. And we're talking mostly about, this is not skilled care like doctors and nurses. This is what's called custodial care, help with washing, dressing, going to the bathroom, cooking, feeding, that sort of thing. Um, in my experience, you wanna make sure the other family members agree to this arrangement because otherwise uh, they may say something like, well, that was uh, an advance on your inheritance. That, uh, that uh, 33,000 a month, $36,000 a year you got for three years of taking care of mom, that's $108,000 uh, you know, $8, and that money uh, should come out of your share of the inheritance. So we wanna bring them aboard, even though you have a contract, uh, we want to avoid having a will contest uh, later on uh, or an estate contest. Um, so as I said, it could be for care or care plus room and board, um, which is the parent is in the son or daughter's home and you're taking care of them. Um, tax wise, because it's income uh, to the caregiver, it will be uh, taxable, but it is a deduction for the person paying the parent but of course that's subject to the, uh, there's a certain floor for medical deductions. You have to discuss that with your accountant, but there may be some deduction available. Um, so caregiver agreements is one way to shelter assets. Now we're gonna talk about the pooled income trust. The pooled income trust is for community-based Medicaid for home care. 
And the problem with home care is very often people have uh, income um, that makes them ineligible for care. Let's say their income is uh, uh, 5,000 a month. Um, and Medicaid allows you to keep maybe uh, you know eight nine hundred dollars, and you have to pay the excess for your care. Well, how are you going to be able to stay home if you have to pay the money for your care, and you have to pay for your uh, electric and a mortgage if you have, and uh, you know maintenance uh, of the property? So um, we have this uh, allowance. An individual can keep about eight hundred eighty four dollars a month. Anything over that has to go towards their care. Couples maybe about thirteen hundred a month. Well, those are very, very low numbers. Uh, how do you get to those numbers? Well, to spend down additional income on care would leave nothing for bills. So what the state allows you to do is send your excess income, the money over your allowance, to something called a pooled income trust. It's kind of a strange duck, but you send your bills to the pooled income trust. There's a contract that you sign and uh, they agree to pay your bills. And money sent to a pooled income trust is not considered income under the Medicaid program. Now, I know this sounds very strange. Uh, first time you're exposed to it, it is very strange, but it actually works. Um, any money you send to uh, pay, how much you send to the pooled income trust, you send enough to pay the bills that you're sending them. Uh, and this allows you to age in place um, by paying your rent, mortgage, utilities, insurance, etc. Um, and qualifying for uh, Medicaid benefits by getting yourself down to somewhere closer to the 884 a month for a single or 1300 a month for a couple. Now, if you can't get down to that because you don't have bills for that, let's say you can only get down to 2000 a month, you're an individual. So the first, you know, $1,116 um, will go towards your care. Um, but that's not going to go very far. The rest will be picked up by Medicaid. Uh, pooled income trust. Um, the individual is only allowed to keep about uh, $10,000. That's actually $16,000. It's a typo. Um, modify these slides. Uh, about $16,000 in assets. Um, so, uh, and there's currently a one month look back on, on, on asset transfer. So if you have more than the 16,000, apologize for the typo. If you have more than 16,000, uh, the, uh, there's a one month look back on transfers. You transfer everything out of your name and the first day of next month, you can get home care services using the pooled income trust to shelter out your excess income. Um, now we know starting in July of next year, there's gonna be a new look back for home care, which is gonna be 30 months. So they're gonna phase it in by adding one month to the look back each month until 2024. What does this look back mean? Well, it means that um, if you've made transfers within that period, um, you're not eligible for Medicaid uh, 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 until you get past the waiting period. So um, one of the things that we recommend is if you want to make yourself eligible for home care later on, if and when you need it, you should move your assets out now into a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust so that you get it out of your name before July 1st and you're subject to the one month look back instead of what is going to be a 30 month look back. So what this means is if people wait and do it after they add this new 30 month look back and they need home care, they won't be able to get it uh, until 30 months after they need it. So they're going, going to have to pay for the first 30 months themselves. If you move your assets out of, out of your name before July 22, um, you'll be eligible for Medicaid from day one because you have a one month look back. So word to the wise, uh, see uh, us or some other elder law attorney uh, this year, early next year to move the assets into a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Later on, you need home care, you'll be eligible from day one. Um, the other changes in the, in the new law, they're gonna, uh, to qualify for home care, you need to be unable to perform any two or more of the activities of daily living. Um, dry bathing, dressing, cooking, feeding, walking, toileting. They're gonna increase that from two inabilities to three, which is considerably more disabled than two. Um, so they're making it harder to qualify.
up, uh, go back, go back, previous, okay, good. Um, so the pooled income trust, uh, if you're diagnosed with, uh, if you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia, Lewy body, um, senile dementia, uh, dementia through Parkinson's, they're gonna be a little more lenient if it's cognitive, cognitive decline, and they're only gonna require one uh, ADL, activity of daily living that you can't perform. Um, we used to be able to get a report from the treating physician stating what um, uh, is needed, but now they have replaced that with something called the Qualified Independent Physician Selected or Approved by the Department of Health for to establish a course of treatment. So you see the government is trying to get more control over this. I suppose they feel that uh, treating physicians have been uh, maybe a little uh, liberal with uh, uh, getting clients or patients the benefits, and they want uh, somebody under their control who's um, an independent third party to approve the course of treatment. We don't know how that's going to work in practice. We think it's going to be very difficult because this is going to be done by a bureaucrat who has never actually met the person. But be that as it may, that's what the plan is. Um, as you can see, the need for the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust has increased greatly so that you'll be able to qualify for these benefits if and when you need them. Again, if you just joined us, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, type them in and we'll answer them all at the end. So the pooled income trust for home care. Strategy three, long-term care insurance. Well, nice if you can afford it, but there's three major reasons why people can't get it. Uh, um, number one, it's too expensive. That's the number one is cost. Number two, about 25% of people who apply get turned down for medical reasons. And three, once you hit age 70, it's prohibitive. Nobody buys it. So most people don't end up with long-term care insurance, but if you are fortunate enough to get it or be able to get it, it's gonna pay for your home care or facility care. Um, and you don't have to worry about qualifying for Medicaid, which is not a walk in the park. Um, how much insurance do you buy? Well, we analyze the daily benefit. Um, so how much does a policy pay a day? How long will the policy pay? What's the elimination period? That's the deductible. In other words, how many days are you going to pay before the insurance kicks in? Generally, we're looking at a 100-day elimination period, which means you say, I'll pay for the first 100 days myself you know, maybe about three months, because this lowers the premium, because obviously, uh, they don't have to pay for the first three months. And, um, you know, that's when the highest risk is, obviously, you know, people start passing away uh, uh, longer than three months, you know, six months, more people die, a year, more people die, two years, eventually. So the first three months, if you pay that yourself, will go a great uh, distance in lowering the actual cost of the insurance. But we don't, let's say the, the facility is $500 a day, which is 15,000 a month. You don't buy insurance for 15,000 a month because you still have your income, your pension, your social security, your requirement of distribution, your interest, your dividends. So look at all your income, because you still have your income, whether you're, you, whether you're at home or in a facility, um, and uh, that income will go towards the cost of your care. So if your income is, let's say, um, uh, we'll say, 9,000 a month, which is 300 a day. If your income is 9,000 a month um, and the nursing home is, is uh, 15,000 a month, so you need insurance for the 6,000 that you're short, which is $200 a day. That's a lot less expense than buying insurance for $600 a day. So we analyze the daily benefit of the policy, the length of the policy, the elimination period factor in your income that tells us how much insurance we need to buy. Uh, New York has what's called the partnership policies, where if you buy that policy, a little more expensive, but um, here you don't need a Medicaid asset protection trust because the state says once the policy is run out, which is today is four years, the old ones were three years, now it's four years, the state will not go after your uh, assets, they'll limit themselves to your income. Well, it's a little bit illusory, not too many people are nursing on more than four years, but if you have a partnership policy, you don't have to protect your assets. When the policy runs out, the state will only agree to only take your income towards the cost of your care. Then we have the hybrid approach, okay? A lot of people wanna have control 
over their caregiving at home. But if they're in a facility, they're not so worried about that. So what they do is they buy much less expensive insurance to pay for home care only. Home care only will say is 200 a day, 6,000 a month. Facility care is 600 a day, maybe 18,000 a month. Well, you don't have to buy insurance for 600 a day. You can buy insurance for 200 a day. That's enough to pay for your home care. If you end up and you use our Medicaid Asset Protection Trust to protect your assets. So if you go into a facility, um, they'll get to 200 a day, but they won't take 400 from your assets. That money will come uh, from Medicaid. So just get enough to pay for home care, 200 a day, 6,000 a month and uh, use the Medicaid trust to qualify for Medicaid if you end up in a facility, a nursing facility. Uh, there are veterans benefits for caregivers, the VA. Um, uh, if, 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 if you're in a long-term care due to a service-connected illness, um, they'll pay regardless. They'll pay for the whole thing. But caregiving is not generally service connected. I mean, people who have served in the Vietnam, I mean, Vietnam War, Korean War, um, uh, you know, uh, the um, Gulf War, um, but um, they don't have long term care needs arising out of that. Um, you do have to prove the disability of physician's letter. Um, and so for most people, it's not service related and there's income and resource limitations, but generally it pays about 2250 a month for the veteran and about half of that for their spouse. If you can show you need caregiving services, as I said before, the help with the activities of daily living, washing, dressing, toileting, transferring, feeding, cooking, that sort of thing. These applications are made by the client themselves through your county office for the aging. Strategy five are using the Medicaid exemptions. So today in New York, a house up to about 900,000 is exempt if you have a spouse living there, okay? So as long as you have a spouse and the house is worth 900,000 or less, that house will be protected. Of course, that's not really a safe harbor because eventually the house, the spouse can die and the house is, is exposed. So don't rely on that. Uh, better to plan ahead and put in a Medicaid trust by the time the first spouse dies, uh, we are not starting to plan then. We already have the house protected because we did it more than five years ago. But if you're up against it, you know, you don't have any planning and you're going to a nursing home and you have a community spouse, the spouse can keep the house, 900,000. They can keep up to 130,000 for themselves out of your resources. Excess has to be spent down. Um, so a single person could keep about 16,000. So that's uh, no typo there, that's correct. Again, uh, if you don't have a spouse, you can only keep 16,000. If you have more than 16,000, it has to be spent down before you qualify for care. This is why people take their money now, money that they're not using, they want to protect for their uh, legacy to leave to their children and grandchildren, they put into the Medicaid trust. So later on, if they need care, it's not available. Uh, if you have a community spouse, they can keep a car. Medicaid doesn't say what kind of car. So um, you could drive a Rolls Royce if you wanted to, and that's an exempt uh, a vehicle. Uh, you can prepay funeral and burial, not just for you and your spouse, for all immediate family members, that's an exemption. You can spend money on that. Um, uh, furniture in the house, if you have a spouse, the spouse can uh, uh, get new furniture, do repairs and improvements to the house, personal effects, uh, that sort of thing. IRAs and 401ks are exempt, uh, 403B, 457. They do get the RMD, the required minimum distribution has to come out, that's income that goes towards your care, but the principal, they can't go into your IRA and get the shortfall. So your IRA is put, putting out 2,000 a month, uh, nursing income is 16,000 a month, they only get the 2,000 RMD. They can't go into your uh, IRA and get the other 16,000. Uh, if you have annuities that are not IRA, annuities are exempt, just like the above. But if you have annuities that are not IRA, as long as you have a spouse and they're the beneficiary, that annuity will be exempt from Medicaid. And if you have our Medicaid trust and the assets in it more than five years, that's exempt. And now two and a half years for home care. And assets in a third party trust. So if somebody else leaves you money besides your spouse, uh, that's third party money 
and that is protected uh, if it's in a third party trust with somebody else as the trustee. Uh, and if you have a, a child uh, under age 65, any assets you transfer to a special needs trust for that child is also exempt from Medicaid. Now, uh, more Medicaid exemptions. As I said, if there's a community spouse, we can uh, do any repairs and improvements on the home, and that's an exemption. Uh, you can pay off a mortgage. You see, let's say there's a mortgage of 100000 on the property. Uh, you can pay off the mortgage. That's not a gift. You're paying a bill. So there's no look back on, on paying bills. You can pay off your mortgage. That's an exemption. Then there's the primary caregiver rule. If you're fortunate enough to have an adult son or daughter living in the house for two or more years immediately prior to the parent going into a nursing home, that house can be transferred to that child. That's an exempt asset. It's called the primary caregiver rule. Uh, the trust can be transferred to a sibling who lives in the home for at least a year. So we, we know a lot of times uh, elderly uh, brothers and sisters live together. They may not never had children. We don't want to put out the elderly brother or sister because uh, one had to go into a nursing home. So Medicaid recognizes this as an issue and says, if you have a sibling who's lived in the house for at least a year, we can transfer it to the brother or sister. And, and this way they have a place to live in for their lifetime. And of course, if they have to go into a nursing home, Medicaid will get that house anyway, because the second one uh, doesn't have a sibling anymore. So we may want to transfer to a sibling, get Medicaid for the brother or sister, and then for the sibling, we do a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, start the five-year clock running in case they need care. Uh, income exemptions for the community spouse. Uh, oh, yeah, previous, okay. So the community spouse can keep a certain amount of, of income uh, to these days, about 3,300 a month if there is a community spouse. They don't rely on your spouse. Do you know that over 80% of people in nursing home don't have a spouse? It's, it's usually the surviving spouse. And it turns out about 80% of people in nursing home are women. And you can probably figure out why that is. You know, women live longer than men and they take care of their spouse, but there's often nobody there to take care of them. So those are our strategy five, the Medicaid exemptions. Uh, then we have MQAs, Medicaid qualifying annuities. This is uh, interesting. Um, so let's say you have to go into a nursing home and you have uh, 300,000 you know, you're only allowed to keep 16. So let's say you have 316,000. So you're over by 300,000. They're going to take all that money uh, for your care before you're eligible for Medicaid. But there's a neat trick. You can buy an annuity. Now, the annuity has to pay back in full within your actual actuarial life expectancy. So it's not a gift. I'll give an example. Let's say the client is 75. Uh, according to life, uh, life expectancy tables, they have a life expectancy of seven years, okay? So seven years, they buy an annuity that uh, pays them back all the money with interest over seven years. Medicaid says that's not a gift because it's coming back to you within your lifetime with interest. So it's not a gift. Why do we use this? Because generally, people's actuarial life expectancies are a lot longer than their real life expectancy. Let's face it, if somebody is 75 going to nursing home, the tables may say they'll live seven years, but in real life, they probably will only live two or three years at the most because um, they have a health issue. So in that case, what happens is the payments for the first three years will go to the nursing home, when the client dies, there's four years of payments left. That goes to the heirs, the family. So it's a way to stretch out your money so that some is left for your family. Your payments will be much less than the nursing home costs. So if you kept the 300000 and the nursing home is, say, um, uh, uh, 15000 a month, you know, the money's going to go very fast. But if it's annuity payment over seven years, it's going to be a lot less than 15000 It'll be you know, maybe half of that at the most. So uh, again, your family will end up saving about half the money because um, clients will generally pass on and leave a number of years left on the annuity because the annuity stretches out the payments. It's actually a neat trick. And the unused balance, as I said, goes to your beneficiaries, your heirs. Strategy seven, spousal refusal. Now, some of us have heard of this. Um, 
the community spouse we know can keep about 3,300 a month in income, up to 130,000 assets, the home up to 900,000. And as I mentioned earlier, the Rolls Royce. Um, so what if you have more than that? Um, well, you know, if you have income yourself over, over the allowance, you know, your income goes towards the cost of your care because you can't shift the income to your spouse, but you can shift assets to, to your spouse, real estate investments. So wife has to go into a nursing home. We transfer all the assets to the husband and he signs a document called the spouse refusal. Only New York and Florida allow this. And this document says, I refuse to contribute to my spouse's care. I need this for myself to live on. Uh, by law, the county has to give Medicaid benefits to the wife. Uh, legally, they can make a claim against the husband for support. But keep in mind, Medicaid doesn't pay. Uh, let's say the nursing home is, is $600 a day, $18,000 a month. Not unusual. Plenty of places in New York charge more. But let's say it's $18,000 a month, $600 a day. Okay. Um, that's the private pay rate. Medicaid doesn't pay eighteen thousand a month. Medicaid pays uh, that facility maybe twelve thousand a month. So um, when you do spousal refusal, it's true that the county can come back after you, but they they can only come back for what they paid. They paid twelve, so automatically or immediately you're getting a thirty three percent discount. They come after you for twelve instead of the eighteen you would have to pay private. So that's a start, but it gets better. Okay. Uh, sometimes the Department of Social Services, they never make the claim. They're too busy. It's not a big enough amount. It falls through the cracks. Stuff happens. You know, it's a it's bureaucracy. So uh, it's a little bit like the lottery. Sometimes you just hit the jackpot. Um, and as I said, if they do make a claim, it's for the Medicaid reimbursement rate, which is much less than the private pay rate because they don't, can only claim what they paid. Um, I've had cases where I've made deals with the county where they will agree to take payment after the community spouse dies. So they say, okay, yo, is this money? We'll take it out of the out of the husband's estate after the after they're both gone. As one county attorney said to me, he said, Mike, the county be, will be around for a long time. We can wait. So uh, that's less painful for the spouse if it comes out of the estate. So we like the spouse refusal. Of course, that's if you have let's spouse refusal. You haven't done any pre-planning, and you have a spouse. Uh, it, it sometimes works. Strategy eight: the gift and loan. Well, this is if you have a cup, uh, a single person. So you have a single person. You can't do spouse refusal. You have the three hundred grand. Now you got a problem because you only keep sixteen. Well, we said you have three hundred sixteen thousand. So you only keep sixteen. You're going to lose three hundred. So for the client on the nursing home doorstep or already in nursing home, how do you protect the 300? Well, it's a little late in the day, but let's say the nursing home is 15,000 a month and you have 300,000 excess resources. Here's the strategy, tried and true, proven many times. We've filed thousands of Medicaid applications and we've used this many times. So what you do with the 300,000, you lend your children 150,000 and you give them 150,000. Now we apply for Medicaid. Medicaid says, um, oh, now on, on the on the $150,000 loan, you sign a promissory note, you say, I agree to pay, um, the kids agree to pay you back that 150,000 over uh, 10 months at 15,000 a month with a little bit of interest. Now remember the nursing home is 15,000 a month. Your loan payments for 10 months are 15,000 a month. Now we apply for Medicaid. Medicaid looks at this and says, well, the loan to the 150,000 is not a gift. There's no penalty because you're getting the money back. But the gift is a penalty. You gave them 150,000. How long could you have paid for yourself in a nursing home with that 150,000? You could have paid for 10 months, right? At 15,000 a month. So Medicaid says, okay, you gave away 150,000. We're gonna give you a penalty of 10 months, the amount of time you could have paid for yourself. So what happens during the 10 months, you're losing the the loan repayments to get past the penalty period because you're getting your loan back, uh, 15,000 a month for 10 months, you're getting those loan payments, you use that to pay past the penalty period. Lo and behold, uh, the penalty period ends, you paid 150,000, the kids get to keep the $150,000 gift, you're eligible for Medicaid. Isn't that great? All this is on my website at trustlaw.com. 
Strategy nine, the darling of the elder law bar, the famous Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Uh, here, to protect your assets, you want to do this at least five years in advance to protect it from nursing home costs, at least two and a half years to protect you from home care costs. But you pick one or more of the adult children as trustees, who are the trustees, the managers of the trust. And you say, in this trust, I limit myself to the income only. And in fact, we call them income only trusts. It means what it says, you only get the income, interest, dividends, that sort of thing. It makes sense for assets you're not gonna spend, like your home, you're not gonna spend your home. For heaven's sakes, move to protect your home. What happens if you own a home and you end up in a nursing facility? or you need home care, you know, they put a lien on the house and the lien gets bigger than the house and eventually uh, they walk away with the house. It happens every day. But a lot of people come in and see me and I'll see they'll have a nest egg that they're not living on. Let's say it's 500,000, not IRA, because remember IRA, 401k, 403b, exempt from Medicaid. I'm talking about non-retirement funds. Clients have a nest egg, let's say 500,000. A lot of clients will tell me, well, we don't need the 500,000 to live on. It's extra money just in case we're living on our income. Some other clients say we're not spending the 500,000, we're taking the interest or dividends. Well, fine, the trust gives you the interest or dividends. But to realize if you have a nest egg that you don't need to live on, you're actually safe keeping it for the nursing home industry. What do you think happens? Client gets 87, 88, they still have the 500,000. Now they have to go into a nursing home. Over the business office, that nursing home, they're jumping up and down because your private pay. In any given facility in New York, about three quarters of the residents are on Medicaid. Is Medicaid paying that nursing home, you know, uh, uh, 18, $20,000 a month? Of course not. Are you getting the same care as everybody else? Well, sure, they just a home run. They just hit a home run with your money and it's totally unnecessary. For more than 30 years, you'll have to take your 500,000, put into that Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, still there if you need it, but somebody else can come and take it away from you. We know there's a five-year look back for facility care, new two and a half year look back coming for home care. Um, so to learn more, uh, I give a seminar every Wednesday at two o'clock, which you can uh, uh, register for. It's called Four Advantages of Using Trust. You can go to my website, trustlaw.com and register for that. Uh, I do it live Wednesdays at two, so you can post your questions, but if you can't make it, you register anyway, uh, and, and um, you get the recording to watch later. Uh, many people are registered for this today that will watch the recording later when it's convenient for them. I'm now worried about our law firm's unique planning process. It's already begun with the seminar. We offer a free initial consultation. Uh, we do a free review of your existing plan. You bring us your will, trust, health proxy, living will, power of attorney, and we troubleshoot it for you. And invariably, we find things that are missing uh, or defects because it wasn't done by an experienced elder law estate planning firm. So we'll tell you if it's legally adequate or if it needs improvement. And then is it personally adequate? Are these still the people you want in charge? Is this still the, the, um, the way you want to leave it? Um, We'll give you a copy of my book, Elder Law Estate Planning, and tell you which chapters apply to your situation. We'll tell you what the fees will be if you decide to go forward later on. But we prefer uh, not to do business in the first meeting because we want to get accustomed to each other. We want to make sure you understand everything you're doing. So we give you my book, ask you to read these chapters. This is your situation. And we ask you to come in for a second free follow-up consultation, maybe two or three weeks later to have your questions answered. Now you come in for the second meeting. We answer any questions you have about what you read, about what we talked about in the first meeting. We draft that estate plan together with you by asking you questions, who you want in charge, who do you want to leave it to, all at once, over time, that sort of thing. Who do you want to make medical decisions? Who do you want to handle legal and financial? Then we give you a detailed three-page written proposal for the fees quoted. And now you tell us what you want to do. A lot of people say, you know, it sounds good. Let's go ahead. And we say, fine. Um, uh, we don't take a retainer. Uh, I believe we're the only firm in the United States that doesn't take a retainer. Uh, all firms are trained. I was trained this way. You know, if a client wants to go ahead, have them sign the fee agreement, give you a check for half. That's called the retainer. Uh, we don't do that because we like the clients to be in control. Uh, our theory is uh, we, and the way we do it is we don't have a retainer agreement. You don't sign anything with us. We sign a proposal. Our proposal says, 
We're going to go ahead and prepare all these documents for you just on your say so. You'll come in two or three weeks later, we'll review all the documents. After everything is signed, you pay at the end. But unless and until you sign and you're satisfied, you owe nothing to the firm. You're, you're free to walk away at any time, which means what? We have changed the dynamic here. And instead of the lawyer being in control, which with the retainer agreement, the lawyer has the money and uh, you don't have anything yet. So the lawyer is in control. We changed the, uh, the dynamic and we put the client in control. And here's our thinking. See if this makes sense to you. If you're in control the whole time, clearly that's the best place for you to be. Now, if you're the client and that's the best place for you to be, and we're here to serve you, then we think that must be the best place for us to be. And it's worked very well. Today, we have over 30,000 satisfied clients. And in fact, uh, it's for this very reason. You come in for that third meeting, we review all the documents, you're satisfied, you sign everything, you pay at the end. Um, we take credit cards here at Ettinger Law Firm, you could pay all at once, or you could pay in three monthly installments. That'll be up to you. That'll be in the proposal. After that, we don't say goodbye. We say welcome to the firm, which uh, is also virtually unknown. I had a client in today, had a plan done by a major firm. Uh, the plan was done in the year 2000. Well, that's 21 years ago. Have they heard from the firm? No. Has anybody listening today heard from the firm that did their plan? No, nobody hears from anybody. Well, of course, their plan was you know, virtually obsolete. That's 21 years ago. The law changed, the tax law changed, um, techniques changed. There's, there's better ways of doing things today, but nobody looks at it. Well, I'm gonna go back a page. I've been the president of Ettinger Law Firm for more than 30 years, and I don't want as my legacy uh, Ettinger prepared 30,000 estate plans that didn't work. I want my plans to work when people need them, not what they wrote them, could be decades earlier. So that plan that those clients had, that worked fine for 2000, but they weren't using it in 2000. It's already 21 years later, they haven't used it. And it's not gonna work when they need it. So I trademarked the process in Washington in 1999 called the Ettinger Elder Law Estate Planning Process. And what we did was, we created a process to make sure our plan works when you need it, not when you wrote it decades earlier. So I publish a law letter, which you'll start getting because you're on this Zoom. It's called the Ettinger Elder Alert. Won an award, excuse me, won an award for it. Um, we publish one article a week, something you need to know. And it's called the Alert because it comes by email. Also goes nicely with Ettinger and Elder, as you can see. Um, so you'll start to get that. But the key is this, every three years, you get a letter from Ettinger Law Firm, time to come in for your free review. We want to see if there's any changes in your health, your assets, your family, births, deaths, marriage, divorces. Now, we've been doing it for more than two decades, so I can tell you how it works. You know, people come in after three years, not too many people need a change. After six years, naturally, more people need a change. But the reason we do it is statistically it's been shown that very few people get past nine or 12 years without needing a major change. Who's in charge, who they're leaving to, something else happened. So you do an amendment. Amendments, they say, average once every 10 years. Um, and you know, it's legal work. You pay for the amendment, uh, uh, but it's still hundreds, not thousands, and you're good to go. Uh, we don't charge for phone calls, emails, or questions. Once you're a client of our firm, it's like we're on retainer. You can call us anytime, email us, you get a correct answer. And you know, that's hard to do today to get the right information. Uh, but by using this program, your plan is never more than three years old, designed to work when you need it, not when you signed it, as I say, I hope in many decades uh, previous. Now I'm gonna invite you to uh, join me uh, for a free consultation, not at the moment, but uh, you'll get an invite as soon as we're done here. Uh, it's a $500 value. You know, a lot of firms charge for the consultation. We don't charge because we like the clients to be in control, but we have a, more experience than a lot of firms that charge. So you're getting a free $500 bill. I think it's worth more because you know we have uh, more than 30 years experience. It'll be with myself or my wife and law partner, Suzanne Ettinger, one of our other uh, eight experienced elder law estate plan attorneys, everybody, uh, is experienced and well trained. So uh, we have quality control here. I can't see everybody, neither can my wife. And um, we have 14 offices, so uh, that's not physically possible, but we supervise everything. The consultations can be in the office, can be by Zoom or by phone. 
you're going to get a copy of this recording. You'll get a copy of my uh, my booklet, e-booklet, Elder Law Estate Planning in a Nutshell, uh, a short version of my book by email. Um, we'll, um, you'll be able to schedule your appointment online using our link called Calendly. It has my calendar, a uh, calendar of every lawyer here. You can pick your time and place and uh, you'll be all set. You can call my director of client relations, Patty Brown. She's been with us more than 25 years. She's at the 800 number on your screen. She can also answer any questions you have. You can email Patty Brown at pbrown at trustlaw.com or text free C to the number on your screen. So uh, there we go for today. Um, if anybody has any questions, this is your moment. Uh, but um, uh, nobody had any questions today, which is good. Um, so I want to thank you for coming. Uh, more information available on our website, trustlaw.com. And uh, we hope to see you all in the office for the free consultation and, and see how this applies to you and if we can help you save uh, your assets and protect your family. So thank you for joining. And may I wish everyone a good afternoon. And I'm Michael Ettinger signing off. Thank you very much.